Um, yeah, so Man United played um, Man City yesterday and we lost comprehensively. Man United played Man, C Man United played Man City at home. Um, it was billed as the title decider. It was billed as the most important game of the season for Man City because it was the you know the 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 fourth to last game. Well, you know um, a game a run of games where they could essentially have the title back in their control as long as they got past us. Um, what people thought was that the fixtures coming up afterwards were ones that they could win, even though they're going to face Burnley and all that sort of stuff. You know, difficult teams they're going to face. They probably thought the banana skin could be against United, even though we haven't been playing well. A local derby is always a local derby. Tensions run high. Everyone's going to want to prove themselves. There's a new manager under in Solskjaer at the helm. Um, players are going to want to play for him. They don't want to be kicked out of the club. Blah, blah, blah. A lot of stake, right? So a lot was built about this game. And, I've, and in, in, to be honest, for the first time ever, I didn't get caught up in the hype. I have to be completely honest. I did not get caught up in the hype. I was very much aware of where we are as a team. I think that three-month period in the beginning where Solskjaer came in and essentially was the good guy um, versus Mourinho's bad guy role. Uh, he was a good cop, bad. He was a good cop um, in comparison to Mourinho being a bad cop. That worked for three months because, you know, he he came in as like the bright, shiny supply teacher who everyone kind of got along with. Who kind of let you kind of come into class three minutes late sometimes. Who let you go out to lunch a little bit earlier. He earned everyone's trust that way. But I think in general, the issue that we have here is that the team just isn't good enough, right? We don't have players good enough to make the difference. We don't have players good enough that can take the mantle on of Manchester United. We don't have the players good enough to make the change. And we ultimately don't have players good enough to play the style of football that even um, Solskjaer wants to play at the moment. Because I think this counter-attacking football, you need a different type of footballer to, to kind of make that system work, especially when things aren't going well. So I wasn't that confident about the game, but you know, I go into it with quite optimism and think, you know what? You never know. We start off pretty well, to be honest. We start off with the first 15 minutes are pretty good. We're putting some decent pressure on City. We're kind of making them shaky. Straight away, we realise that Vincent Company is a weak link in the defence, maybe because of his injury record, maybe because he's getting on in age. But he was a weak link. N not to say he's, he's as bad as Jones or Smalling, but in that City team, he's probably the weakest link in the team and someone we could probably get at. We saw Kyle Walker leaving loads of space as he was bombing forward or sometimes, you know, his concentration goes, he drifts inside sometimes. So we saw that there was opportunity for us to punish them. But as per usual, United... We don't tend to punish teams when we see a weakness. I think the old United of, of yesteryear, and, and I think as most great teams, as you see them, what they tend to do is that when a team is on the ropes, when a team is kind of a bit shaky, when a team exposes a vulnerability to them, um, sometimes through no fault of their own, the good team tends to always punish them. Always. It's a standard kind of trait you see. It's usually in European football games, especially at a higher level, when someone makes a mistake, it doesn't go unpunished, right? Because usually the best players are able to pounce on that and the best players kind of live for those moments, especially when they're training. They have that in mind that, you know, even though you're facing... Because, for instance, think of, it, think of a Champions League game. You're going to be facing some of the best teams in the world, right? Or the best teams in Europe. You're going to come across some of the best players in the world. So it's likely that they're going to be able to shut you out of the game through no fault of your own. So you have to keep in mind when you're a great player that you're going to get one opportunity. They're going to make one mistake. You're going to force them into making an error. You're going to skip past them one time. You have to make it count. So we didn't make it count. Um, we had a couple of kind of half chances where the final ball really let us down. We didn't really um, get the ball to the players that they needed to get. And let me actually get a lineup here so I can comment on some of the players and go through some player ratings. But we didn't, we didn't kind of, we didn't punish them the way we should have punished them in order to kind of make really make a difference. And then as as it as the game progressed, you and you always thought that City were always kind of in second gear. It reminded me a little bit of the Barcelona game, um, especially in the second leg. Um, it felt like Barcelona were always in second gear, that they were when they wanted to score, they would... I mean, when Man City wanted to score, they could score. And then inevitably, in the second half, we came out and you could tell that I think the endurance, the fitness level, sorry, had dipped considerably, um, which is very concerning because I didn't, we didn't do that much running, really. If you, if you look at it, I don't think City moved us around as much as they have done with other teams. They didn't really stretch us all over the pitch. Um, for the most part, the midfield were doing most of the running. Some so, Sometimes it was Lingard, then Rashford. But our whole team looked completely shot when they came out for the second half. Um, some of them might be planning their holidays. I don't know what's going on. But either way, we didn't look like we were a team that was going to um, punish City or were able to kind of score. We probably would have, if we were going to score, it was going to come from a set piece or something. Uh, City then ended up scoring a goal through Bernardo Silva, a very well taken goal. Some commentators on I've been watching on uh, on the TV and stuff have been saying that oh um, David de Gea should have done should have done a bit better with the goal. I don't agree at all. I think that was an incredibly great uh, that was an incredible finish by Bernardo Silva. If you look if you check the goal again quickly, if you check the goal again on the replay, he approaches um, Shaw on his left foot and that and 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 um, 
what do you call it? Um, purposely runs towards him, takes carries the ball exactly that like super direct, runs it directly to him. Kind of reminds me of what um Ian Robin does when he's kind of scoring that bendy kind of goal that he always does. He always kind of runs directly towards the defender. Then at the last minute, dinks it out left and then bends it around. Because what then happens, if you look at it from the goalkeeper's point of view, the, the goalkeeper knows the shot's coming, but they don't know when it's coming. So by the time the goalkeeper's realised that he's dinked it to the left, it's already, it's already left his boot and he can't save it by that time. And what made uh, Bernardo Silva finish even more impressive, it reminds me of the shot that Rooney used to do a lot in the early in the early stages of his United career, but he kind of wasn't able to finish it in the latter stages. That kind of shot that Rooney does where he pushes the ball out and then instead of, and then instead of shooting on the two step, he, shot, he shoots kind of on a one and a half step or a one step, and he always goes for the near post and the far post because that kind of technique they're usually shooting with when you're kind of like cutting in. Usually you're aiming for the top corner of the opposite side you're shooting towards, like usually towards sorry, um, towards the left hand side. You're not usually trying to cut it near post; you're trying to cut it to the far post. It's just a really clever technique, and I think he just caught out David de Gea. It's a really really clever technique. I don't think you can blame David de Gea for that. Maybe in yesteryears when David De Gea was getting voted our best player of the season, 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 best player of the year, season, this season, out, he might have been able to save that. But I think David De Gea of, now, of nowadays probably not. And I just think it was a very good finish. So that that was a crucial moment because I think we could have then straight after that goal we had a couple of opportunities with Lingard where we could have where we could have scored one opportunity he kind of fluffed his lines didn't get it didn't part didn't uh, was able it was control it he kind of ran. Uh, in front of the ball, then a second chance was the one that was just unex, unex, um, unacceptable, really. The one where the ball came across the goal and he just completely missed, missed kicked it and it went out of play. And then from then on, you just felt as if like we were never going to score because we needed that quick reaction to kind of get us back into the game. It was never going to happen. And then, um, of course, uh, City have a have an injury that forces them into bringing on the player. And instead of bringing on a like for like substitution for Fernandino, they bring on Leroy Sana, who I'm sure everyone in the stadium was like afraid when he came on. And immediately, Ashley Young was completely getting ripped on that side. For instance, well, to be honest, Ashley Young did hold his own quite well when Sane came on, but just the threat of Sane out there, out wide, really, really hugging the touchline was something that a lot of our defenders couldn't handle. And they kind of, and City moved us around really well in the counter-attack. Sterling kind of brings it forward. Um, Sergio Aguero does an amazing run. He pulls all our our defenders to one side. Sterling whips the ball out wide to Sane. And Sane just goes for pure power and somehow manages to like burst the ball completely through uh, David De Gea. Even though David De Gea's foot saves that he usually does, uh, his kind of staple uh, goalkeeping um, uh, choice didn't actually work this time. So essentially, we got beat very thoroughly. There was no way we were going to come back. Uh, if if there's any fault for the manager, I also maybe brought any substitutions a bit late. Um, I think we had uh, Lukaku and Martial come on. And, I think Lukaku, sorry, and Sanchez come on an 82nd mi- minute. Lukaku came on after the second goal. They were probably too late of a substitution. I think I would have made a change straight. I think I would have made a change after Lingard missed those two chances because I think it was very fairly obvious we weren't going to create anything a- again. We need to kind of disrupt a city style, of city's play, pause the game, bring on, bring on a couple of the fresh faces, and then try again that way. But it just didn't work out. It didn't happen. We were we were beaten by the far better side. And um, I'd say moving on quickly to player ratings um looking at the lineup now um player ratings well i'd give david de Gea maybe a free again i don't think he was at fault for this that uh for the bernardo silver goal no I, i'm gonna give him a four he wasn't at fault for the bernardo silver goal um he was at fault maybe for the leroy sunny goal but again he hit, hit with a lot of power his distribution wasn't great but i just think he just plays with a team or with defenders that aren't good with receiving the ball under pressure so that's probably why he's under pressure kicking the ball out too so his balls have to be inch, pinch um inch perfect to reach the reach their destination and even if they are there's no guarantee the player's going to receive it like fred's really small uh, he can't really hold the ball up well pogba can do it well but again you're asking you're you're getting you're isolating our best player and making him get surrounded by free players which isn't beneficial um selling it long to Pereira isn't a good idea either so i just think his distribution isn't helped by the players that are in front of him so i'll probably give him a four ashley young was his usual terrible self he didn't do that much bad but it's consistently bad and i think the concerning thing about ashley young is the lack of attention he gets from pundits uh, Gary Neville said the other day we shouldn't focus on Ashley Young because we have other players who should be stepping up and doing more than what Ashley Young is doing. But we should be focused on him because he's the one that constantly gets picked. He shouldn't be getting picked. That's that's the problem. He's that bad. He shouldn't be playing. I don't care about his experience. He can't play at right back. Um, he can't cross. He can't pass the ball. He's horrible going forward. And this is the thing that's really weird about Ashley Young. It's like I don't expect him to be a good defender. He's a converted winger. 
He, he's a converted winger into a right back. I don't expect him to be a good defender. I don't think any Man United fans should sit there and say we expect um, Ashley Young to be a version of Cafu. That isn't going to happen. He's not going to be that player. Cool. But what we expect is for him to be at least good at attacking. The thing that he was doing back in the day when he used to be a winger, right? You expect him to be, okay, if he's not going to be a good defender, at least the the best thing he can do is that when he pushes the ball out of his feet and gets away from the defender, he whips in the mean cross. Fine, that's okay. But he can't even do that. The best cross he did probably the whole season was a free kick he took in the first half. Or, no, sorry, in the second half, that um that that whipped, that kind of landed on the penalty spot. Inch-perfect cross. Um, our uh, Rashford didn't really make good movement to run onto it. Our def- uh, all our players were kind of behind the Man City players. And uh, I think uh, company was able to knock it out. But apart from that, really abject performance. I'm going to give him a four. Uh, Damian was surprisingly quite solid. Again, a player who probably should play a lot more than what he's getting played. I know he's not as good as any other player that we have. He's, he's, not, he's nowhere near the level of Man United. I understand that. But you have to pick between Ashley Young and Matteo Damian. I'm picking Matteo Damian every day of the week. I know what I get from him. He's a terrible defender, but he also tries to get forward. He isn't afraid to get the ball under pressure. He puts his head where it hurts. He's good. He's strong in the tackle. He's a bit. He's a bit cynical because of his Italian roots and stuff. He can be a little bit. You know, he, his gamemanship is on point. He's terrible, and I understand all around. He's terrible. There's the reason why he hasn't played that much. But he should be playing ahead of Ashley Young, especially if you're not going to play the kids. If you're not going to play the kids because you want experience, play play Damian. Damian should play. So I'll give him a five. Smalling was fucking garbage again. Not much wrong defensively, but the issue is that because of his lack of calmness, because he de- can't, because he can't play with the ball from the back, because he can't receive the ball at his feet, we are so deep as a team. We receive the ball so so deep because Pope doesn't have to pick it up from him because he can't bring it forward. He's really really bad, and this goes to explain why the game's distribution is so shit because he can't pass the ball to Smalling. He just can't pass the ball to him because he's not going to be able to play out wide. He's not going to be able to play out to anyone. Four. Uh, Lindelof, fairly quiet, did not, didn't do that much wrong, maybe a five. Luke Shaw, pretty terrible going forward, didn't really take on his man, didn't really offer an outlet on the left-hand side, was incredibly timid, he looked like he didn't really want to get ripped by his players, four. Um, Pereira, probably never a Man United um, starter, he's probably a good squad player in the same vein as Fred, I think they're two players who give their all, they're two players that are always showing for the ball, so I'm very, cr- I, I'm, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to him because when I see them play, they're always showing for the ball, even in tight spaces. They want to receive it. They're trying to make a change. You can tell that, you know, you can tell from the defeat at Everton till now, he's probably been one of our best trainers. He's probably been running around, skating into tackles, scoring goals. He's a player that I'm sure a lot of managers, when they come in new, would want him in their team because he gives his absolute all and he loves playing for the club. Um, He's probably just not technically at a level it needs to be uh, for us to win top honours. This particular game, he did not, he did, he did, um, he, he had some misplaced passes. He was a bit slow in possession. He should have shot sometimes when he carried the ball sometimes, but overall, I'll give him a five. Uh, Fred, same thing too. Probably his most courageous performance, but I think someone mentioned it earlier that Man City wanted to buy him a few seasons ago, a couple seasons ago. So I think it shows in the way that they kind of marked him out of the game. Every time he got the ball, they sort of like closed him down, didn't give really give him time to get the ball out of his feet. He's not the quickest to getting the ball out of his feet and looking up, but when he does get time, he's very good on the ball. Um, he was making loads of forward passes. I think probably more than any other player outside of Pogba. So I'm very I'm very thankful for that. So I will give him a five again. Uh, Paul Pogba was fairly good, I think. And uh, again, he gets scapegoated a lot because I think he's because of the price tag. But I think um, he was again. It, I don't really agree with his ratings or votes, but he was voted PFA in the PFA player, Team of the Year, the only Man United player to get in that team. And I think it's for a reason, right? He's a good player. He's probably our only world class player in that team, apart from David De Gea, who's kind of suffering a crisis of confidence at the moment. Um, and he tries. He's really trying to get his foot on the ball. He's trying to make a difference. But the players just aren't good enough to kind of help him make that change. Um, he did try a few uh, passes over the top that kind of went to nowhere. He did try a few passes to some people that didn't go anywhere. He did lose possession sometimes. But I think every time he loses possession, you always have to look who is actually in front of him. And it turns out we can't see it on the TV cameras. But there was no options. No one was making intelligent runs. Smalling and Rashford were just running around like headless tickets. I mean, Smalling and... Lingard and Rashford running around like headless chickens. So I'll give him probably a six. I think so. Because he was trying at least to do something. And you could tell, you know, that maybe it's just his heart is not in it. And he's probably already decided he's going to go somewhere else. Rashford, again, pretty terrible. He's been terrible for a while. No one's really talking about it. Because I guess he's the golden child in the same way of Harry Kane. But he's been pretty shit. Um, again, no real intelligence when he's on the ball. His footballing IQ is really low. 
he's kind of similar in a vein of Lukaku, I think, in the fact that if you don't give him time to think, you just feed him balls for him to run onto and sprint and just smash balls in the top corner. He's amazing. But I think if you give him time to think and stuff and it's not instinctual, it's not one-two touch through football, he doesn't know what to do. Case in point, there was a bit, I think, in the second half or the first half where it was kind of it was about to be two-on-one and um, uh, Lingard was trying to decide where to run to kind of make the spaces and Rashford just decided to like kick it and run past um, somebody and he got completely out of the out of the out of bounds I was like what are you doing just carry the ball a bit further out the pitch and make the and make the defender make you a, make the uh, uh, force the defender into making a choice of what he what he wants to do then commit him and then maybe nip it past get a free kick or a pen and then kind of square it off to Lingard wherever it may be but I just think his footballing IQ isn't there and talking about footballing IQ just lack of quality Jesse Lingard there was a time in day, right, where I saw on some forums, again, I'm only, I'm only going to mention forum stuff because I don't know if it's social media people saying it. But I remember there was a time of day, or there was a time when the, and we were getting linked with Antoine Griezmann and everyone was saying, oh, we don't need Griezmann, we've got Lingard, right? Because they kind of occupy the same sort of role in the team. That kind of second striker, false nine, that in, in between the, that, that little hole a position just behind the two strikers. And some people were saying, oh, we don't need um, a Griezmann, we've got Lingard. And I think games like this and other games as well, you might have seen, sometimes even playing for England, the la- the sometimes the quality, he's a good player, right? He tries his heart out, um, he runs a lot, but I think just the, the top level quality needed to really make a difference in the big games, Lingard just doesn't have it. That chance across the box, I'm sorry, you just finish it, you just score and your team gets one, your team is one all, uh, they don't deserve to be one all and then we go again. You just score that goal, it's not that big of a chance to miss really in that respect. And I think outside of that, his runs, the way he shows for the ball, how he plays one twos, his lack of his passing range isn't as good as it probably should be. Um, his control isn't where it should be. His decision making when he's got the ball in the final third isn't where it should be. He just isn't at the level that we need. Again, a good squad player in the same vein as Rashford, Pereira, Fred, great squad players. Even Damian, even Shaw, good squad players. But as in, the, as in, to form the overall nucleus of your side, no way, Jose. They can't be. They can't be the players that we that we aim to take forward. So I think overall, I'll probably just give him a four or five. I don't know. Let's get to a four. Um, the subs, no point even mentioning them really. Lukaku was absolute garbage when he came on. Control, like it's he reminds me of Fellaini, like in that worst possible sense. Everything just bounces off of him. Uh, Sanchez and Marshall had no time to come on. It was very uh, no time to make a difference. Maybe Solskjaer did wrong there, but I'm not really going to blame him too much because I don't think any difference, any change could have made any any difference at all. Um, but it's very telling how angry Marshall looked when he came on. He was furious. He definitely thought he should have played from the beginning. But again, he was fucking shit against Everton and he got dropped rightfully so because he didn't play well. Um, so that's the player ratings done and out of the way. Um, and on to the kind of future business of United. So um, just to kind of wrap this up, I'm worried, right? And I'm worried because it seems like, especially in the recent years, I think people have started to realise, I think Man United fans like myself and others who were calling for Wayne Rooney to be sold before he got that new contract, who were up in arms when Smalling Jones got offered new contracts and people were saying that we don't need defenders because we were playing well that first three months, we just need attacking players. For the people that were saying those kind of things, the ones that were kind of upset that we sold Daily Blind, um, uh, the ones that we were the ones that were pissed off that Fellaini was still in our team, even though the pundits and journalists were telling us Fellaini is a good option and he offers something different. We are, we were, we've always kind of known this day would come, but I, we didn't. I don't think all of I don't think us United fans knew how big the issue was. I don't think we knew the scale of the rebuild needed to take us to the next level or to have us even. I've, I've been mentioning on social media a couple of times, especially yesterday. I was going on, on a few rants. It's not even what we need in order to win again. It's what we need in order just to compete, just to be in a conversation. In the same way like Tottenham are, right? No one expects Tottenham to win the league, especially with the, with the budget they have. But just to be in the, com- in the conversation, to be in amongst that conversation, to like take points off the top four, to, to be in a good run of games, to um, get to the latter stages of the European um, uh, uh, Championships, to get to the latter stages of the, of the League Cup, of the FA Cup, on, and to fight on all those fronts. We need so much work in that overall team, in the club of how it looks at things and the mentality, the psyche, that it really boggles belief. It, it's really starting to worry me that, that they decide to go with Solskjaer for this job. Because I think it's a, I think especially when, especially when Mourinho failed, because I think when you look at it from the managers that we've hired and fired, we hired, um, you know, David Moyes, who was kind of like, you know, the steady Eddie, uh, reliable Everton man, a Premier League manager who kind of got Everton to finish in the top 10 or top six consistently over a number of years with a limited transfer budget. And uh, thinking was, you know, he with those modest means, well, guess what he could guess? We, we only, we, um, 
Wonder what he could do at Man United. Once he got there, he was never really Man United level. He could never really adapt to that level of football, to that level of kind of prestige, to the pressures, to whatever. Maybe he just couldn't handle that platform. And he right, he so got sacked. Like terrible manager, I think so far. Managers, you should always judge them not by the job that they got sacked by, but their overall body of work. And judging by the amount of teams he's been hired and fired by, the fact that he's got no job now and doesn't seem like he's going to get one very soon, especially in the in the in the new era of football that we're in now, goes to show that he was a terrible choice in the first place. Then you get Louis Van Gaal, who's got a footballing philosophy, comes from a school at the the, the the Ajax Academy of football, total football, the, total football, the kind of football that we kind of hoped that we kind of would play, would evolve into, especially after the spankings we got from Barcelona in two thousand nine and two thousand eleven. That didn't work out. Then you go for Mourinho, who's like the the reliable choice, right? Everywhere he's gone, he's won a championship, right? You give him money, you let him do what he wants with the with the squad. He hires him, he hires and fires who he wants, and he will deliver you a championship. This is what his CV has shown us, right? And he couldn't do it. Now, don't get me wrong, he came during the time of a very adept um, Man City, um, steered by a very, you know, one of the best coaches in the world, if not the best coach in the world in Pep Guardiola, fair, with owners who are willing and able to give him a, any any amount of money he wants to keep the club going, cool. But if Mourinho couldn't do it, and he couldn't get the players that he wanted to, he couldn't get the players in he wanted to, the players he did get in who are, were fucking garbage, he didn't get time to maybe rewrite his wrongs, because, you know, again, we can't really wait around for him to kind of get better. It kind of makes you think that they probably should have gone for a manager who was able to rebuild something of this stature because this is going to take a lot of rebuild. Not only would you have to replace, let's say, maybe six first-team players. I'm looking at the lineup now. And you'd probably, if imagine if David De Gea goes, you're going to need an, another sub-goalkeeper sub behind Romero unless maybe you take him on the kids and bring those back. Um, you're going to need a replacement for Young and Damian. You're going to need a replacement for Smalling. That's free. You're going to need competition for Lindelof and, or a partner and Shaw. Um, so you've already got four players there in the back line. You're going to probably need to replace one of Pogba, Fred or Pereira because one of them are going to probably go. Two of them are probably going to stay and be squad players. You're probably going to need to replace or um, make um, two options or one option up front that's going to replace Lukaku, Rashford, Lingard or Sanchez. Like there's so much work to be done in that team. It's going to take a lot of foresight and a lot of like vision a really long pl game plan to kind of really get it back to where it needs to be. And I think at the moment, with the rumours coming out that Mike Phelan, a person that was, uh, you know, coaching in the Australian League before he came back to Man United, a person who, even when he was at Man United, was ra uh, widely regarded as a bit of a joke, is suddenly now be held in as some coaching genius who can somehow manage to scout all these players and have a football philosophy and able to identify the weak points in our team. I just don't get it. I just, I don't understand it. I don't understand why... It, and again, I'm not being knee jerk here, but I just, I'm just, I'm just not too sure if Solskjaer is going to be the man for the job. It's a really, really big managerial job to do. It's not just about signing three or four players. Get us, because if there was, if Solskjaer was given the Tottenham job, it would probably make a lot more sense, right? Because he just needs to keep that, keep that momentum, keep them in and around the top six. Maybe sign a couple of players, move a couple of players on, and he's probably, he's probably done a good job, right? If he finishes fifth again next season. With Tottenham off fourth, he's probably done a good job. No one's going to be moaning in the Tottenham stands, right? They have a good, another good European competition. But to take Man United from six now, if we finish outside the top, up top four, which I'm not bothered about, I don't get why some fans are obsessed with the top four. Why should we get in the Champions League if we're just not going to compete and make up the numbers? It doesn't make any sense. Yes, the European night, but it's, it's a waste of time. We shouldn't turn into Arsenal. We want to be in these competitions to win this. We don't want to just be there for the sake of being there. Um, doesn't make. Any, I'd rather just not get top four and just start again. Um, and then not getting the top four as well, we're, we're obviously going to force the Glazers' hand because they're not going to get the Champions League money, which is the only thing they're really worried about. And Ed Woodward will look bad again, um, which I'm, I'm surprised his job isn't under threat either because, you know, he's been absolutely garbage. But um, yeah, I just, I just don't, I just, um, it's going to take a lot of time. It's a big rebuild. I spent about half an hour talking about it. It's half an hour too much of my time. And um, yeah, I just don't know what, what what the future holds. We've got Chelsea now on Sunday. People are still thinking we're going to win that. I don't know why you think we're going to win that. I don't think we're going to win another game this entire season. Probably going to draw a couple. Um, we're completely short. Our players don't want to be there. Pogba looks like he wants to go, which I don't blame him if he wants to go. He's clearly our best player in the team. I think every time he gets on the ball, he looks up. There's no running. There's no movement. He has to he has to run all the way back to defence and receive the ball. He doesn't receive the ball further up the pitch because our defenders can't bring the ball out. Um, we've got terrible players all over the park. We've got average players all over the park. We seem to have a, a, a club infrastructure that doesn't really accommodate for foresight or vision. 
I don't really hear any murmurs out there because I remember there was a time in the first three months where we were doing really well and then rumors were coming out that we don't need a defender anymore. We've identified we don't need a defender. We just need to take, get attacking players. It's like, no, we do need defenders. You can't play counter-attacking football, sit deep and have shit defenders. Even if you don't want defenders that can play out from the back, you need to have defenders that can defend if you're going to sit that deep. It doesn't make any sense. Like, And if anything, we're probably a bit too top-heavy. Like, We could probably get away with signing an entire back four and not signing one attacking player. We'll probably be a lot better than what we are now. I guarantee you. We get four new defenders right, to cover that entire back four that are starters, not squad players. Absolute first-teamers, right? Wan-Bissaka, um, <coughs> um, Harry Maguire, Toby Alderwell, maybe keep Shaw, like keep those, get a whole new defense and suddenly our team is transformed. But to say that we, we don't need any defenders, we don't need more attackers to, to get us the top, no, it's not true. You could stick Sergio Aguero up front for us. It's not going to work because we don't get the ball to him. We're not going to play the way that he was, what he wanted to get the ball to him in the first place. Our defense, we defend too deep. So it's just like, again, I'm really disturbed. I don't know. It's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time. We've got players that aren't going to want to move. <laughs> For, I've got a weird suspicion that players like Smalling and Jones have a very delusional sense of self. I've got a feeling that they are they got, they really do think that they're of Man United quality. I remember Jones coming out and saying something that really irked me one time about how he deserves to start or something. These players are fucking delusional. They're absolutely delusional. They don't have an absolute scooby what level they're at because they've never been able to play with top cast players since Sass really retired. They haven't had that real pressure. They've always been, they've kind of been relied on. Um, they've been they survived three managers, so I guess in your head, if you're a player, you probably would say, "Ah, oh, if I if I've survived three managers, obviously I'm rated." Like what Smalling said when he wasn't picked for the England squad to go to the Euros, let's go to the World Cup, right? England, even Gareth Southgate doesn't pick him to for, for England. I, think I remember him saying something along the lines of, "Oh, well, I start for Man United, it's the biggest club in the world. I don't care about England." It's like you only start for us because we've got inept owners. We got we don't have we don't have a, an infrastructure that can identify what we what style we want to play at what style we want to play, the players that can play that style, the players that can't and ship them out, we don't know. So we have to keep you because we don't have any other assets in our team to really start ahead of you. And somehow this guy's going to get a, a fucking testimonial. Wow. Wow. But anyway, um, that's enough for Man United. I, I don't sure where it's going to happen, what's going to go on from now on, but it's a big job for Oli. I really hope he does well and he succeeds, but I'm just not too sure it's going to work out.